Hello everybody, it's Greg again with another video from Galatians. Uh, if you're a tour keeper, you've had Galatians, probably chapter 3, thrown at you time after time after time. Just read Galatians 3, it makes it clear we are no longer under the law. Now, I will admit this chapter has been challenging for me. Uh, we've been studying it pretty intensely here the past few weeks, deciding that, look, if we're going to do this thing, we have to be able to explain everything. And there's a passage in here that has troubled me for years, and I finally feel like I have some uh, explanation, some understanding on it, and I want to share it with you. First, I want to read from Galatians 3. We're just going to look at verses 15 through 21. It says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, which is Christ or Messiah. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, that's my problem, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. All right. So here's the problem. There's a lot of things in here that seem to make it very clear that we do not need to obey the Torah anymore. But... If that's correct, then there's a lot of contradictions in this passage, passage that I just read. And I want to start with verse 17. This, is, this has tripped me up for years. It says, This is what I mean, the law which came 430 years afterward. Now, 430 years after what? This is after 430 years after the father made promise to Abraham that through his offspring all the nations would be blessed. Now, here's the... Uh, the difference between those two, and that is, first of all, if God makes a promise, he says, I'm going to do something, then it's going to happen regardless of how you respond to it. But the Torah, the law, is full of conditional statements. Uh, I used to hear this song all the time in the church I used to attend. We're blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when we come and when we go. Well, the problem is that's just taking part of a verse and running with it. If you actually go to Deuteronomy 28, it says... If you obey the law, then you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. And in the same chapter, you scroll down just a little bit, it says, If you don't obey the Torah, you'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the field, cursed when you come, cursed when you go. Uh, so the Torah is different from the promises of God because the Torah blessing you is dependent on your obedience. But a promise of God is nobody can do anything about that. It's going to happen. Now, having said that, look at verse 17. It says, this is what I mean, the law which came 430 years afterward. That is very confusing, and I'll show you why. This, this indicates that there was no law prior to 430 years later, and that's referring to the time uh, that the children of Israel came out of Egypt and were at Mount Sinai, were given the stone tablets and all of that. But here's the thing. If we go to Genesis 26 and 5, we read about Abraham, and this is Yahweh speaking. He says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And that word laws there is the word Torah. Torah. Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, kept my commandments, kept my statutes, and kept my Torah. How in the world can Paul say that the Torah came around 430 years after Abraham and yet Yahweh says, Abraham obeyed my Torah. Can both of those statements be true? That's very confusing. Now let's go back. Now whether or not you believe we're supposed to keep the commandments in the Torah, you have to be able to explain that glaring contradiction if that's what law this is talking about. Now here's the thing. If we go back and look all throughout Genesis, we can see so many of the commandments in place way before Abraham. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Cain and Abel had their offerings 
uh, to the father. We see that Abel offered an animal, a burnt offering, and that pleased the father. But Cain tried to give him like a squash or a zucchini or something, and Yahweh was not happy with that. Now, you have a choice. Either God is a cruel parent who leaves it up to his kids to try to figure out what he likes, or he told them what he wanted, and Cain decided, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to offer him you know, something from the ground instead of an animal, which is what he instructed. So somebody told Abel that's what God wanted. So we see that knowledge is all the way back, um, all the way back at the time of Adam and Eve. Uh, we can go on and see that uh, Noah, for example, knew the difference between clean and unclean animals when that's not written down anywhere until Leviticus uh, chapter 11. But Noah only took two pigs on the ark, but he took 14 cows. So we see the dietary commandments in place all the way in Genesis 6. When Joseph went down to Egypt, um, Potiphar's wife tried to get him to sleep with her. And he said, no, I will not commit this sin against my master and against my God. Well, if there was no Ten Commandments that said you shall not commit adultery, how did Joseph know that was a sin? Who's to say it is a sin? Paul says where there is no law, there is no sin. So all of these things, and we could go on a list and, and list a bunch of other examples if we wanted to, but yet we see uh, Paul is saying the law came 430 years afterward. We just read the scripture. Abraham kept the Torah. So how could, it, how could he have kept it and it come 430 years later? Let's, let's uh, continue and show some more what seem to be contradictions. Um, let's go down to verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. So let's test that. Is there life in the Torah? Could the Torah give life? I say yes, it can. And that's a problem. Let's go have a look at Deuteronomy 30, 15. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of Yahweh your God that I command you today by loving Yahweh, by walking in his ways, keeping his commandments, statutes, and his rules, all the stuff that Abraham kept, according to Genesis 26.5, then you will live. If you obey, you will have life and you will be blessed. Uh, scrolling on, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. And this is how you choose life, by loving God and obeying his voice and doing his commandments. So is there life in the Torah? I mean, that's what the scripture says. Let's go look for some more witnesses and not depend on one verse. Proverbs 13, 14. This word teaching is the word Torah. The Torah of the wise is a fountain of life. Let's look at another proverb. 19, 16. Whoever keeps the commandment keeps his life. He who despises his ways will die. So is there life in the law? Yeah, there is. I mean, we just gave you several verses that prove that. But how then does he say if, uh, if a law, right here, if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Well, here's another apparent contradiction. This certainly implies that righteousness does not come by the Torah. Now, who wrote the book of Galatians? Paul did. There's another book that people like to uh, quote from, and that's the book of Romans. Now, let's go see what else Paul said in Romans 2.13. He said, It is not the hearers of the Torah, the law, who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So the same guy says that if you're not just a hearer, but a doer of the law, you'll be righteous and you'll be justified. And then over here, he implies that righteousness does not come by the law. So, you see the apparent contradiction. Uh, it sounds like Paul is talking out of both sides of his mouth. So, how do we have a law being added 430 years after Abraham kept it? I mean, you can't have it both ways. So, there is an answer, and the answer is that this refers to the Levitical priesthood 
and the sacrificial system that dealt with sin. Now, you read the whole chapter for yourself and look at it from that context, and it will make so much sense. Abraham did know about the commandments of what thou shalt and thou shalt not. He knew the difference between clean and unclean animals. He knew the dietary commandments. All of the things that we are supposed to do that your everyday man can do in the Torah, he did. Yahweh witnesses that in Genesis 26.5, so that's not my opinion, that's a fact. Um, but there was something that was added 430 years later, and that was the Levitical priesthood and the system of sacrifices. It even says in the passage, why was the law added? It was added because of transgressions. It says that in verse 19. So here's the thing. Abraham had a priest that he went to. He was called Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. And this was Yeshua. Because we learn in Hebrews, he had no mother, no father, no beginning of days, no ending of days. So there was already a priesthood system in place. But then the Torah came along, and because people didn't keep the Torah, he added something until the promise should come. He added the priesthood. He said, these Levites are going to sacrifice animals, and they're going to make atonement for you until this promise that I gave Abraham finally comes into place. So I'm going to confirm that with Hebrews chapter 7. Let's go back to our Bible. We're going to understand this very clearly. In uh, Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to read 11 through 28. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. Now, there you go. This confirms what I just read in, in Galatians chapter 3. We know the Torah already existed. Uh, we know that people knew the commandments. They knew the dietary laws, etc., etc. We can post other examples. But here we see that the law came through the Levitical priesthood. It said, uh, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. This is another passage that gave me a lot of trouble because, you know, we believe that the Torah is forever. And there are a lot of scriptures that say that the law can't change. Deuteronomy 4, 2 says, Do not add to and do not take away from my commandments that you may be able to do them. But here we have an example that, that when there's a change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law. Now, I would tell you that that word change is made a thesis, which means a, a transfer from one place to another. It's not that the commandments changed. It's that the administration left the earth and went into the heavens. Now, that's not something new. Understand that Melchizedek already existed, and he already was a priest. It was temporarily transferred to the Levites, and then once Yeshua came, he took it back, and he took it to heaven with him. Uh, so let's continue reading. Verse 13, for the, for the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him... You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here you go, verse 18, big one. For on one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Now, the law is not weak and useless. People are. <laughs> the Levites messed up. If you've read the Bible, you know that they did not obey the law. They did not administer the law in righteousness they were flesh, and they screwed up. So that is what was weak and useless, was men's, man's administration of Yahweh's commandments. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced. A better hope meaning a better priest. Uh, and it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made... Uh, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him... The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. 
And notice we're talking about those who formerly became priests. Because the priesthood has been transferred back to its original owner. Verse 22, this makes Yeshua the guarantor of a better covenant. It's not different rules and different commandments. It's different administration. Um, I was just talking to somebody. I was talking to my mom, actually, about uh, uh, the oil changing place right down the road. There's a place that it is known the manager was a bad dude. You'd go. You'd tell him to rotate your tires. If you, if you chalked your tires, you would see they'd charge you for rotating your tires, but they, they wouldn't do it. Well, uh, I was passing by that place the other day and saw a big sign sticking in the front the front of the business new management and the thing is when you go the prices are the same what they do is the same nothing changed in the service uh, the actual doing of it but the administration changed so now you actually get what you pay for and this is a perfect analogy for this so continuing on the former priests because it's now in heaven with Yeshua were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily. Here we have another difference in the priesthood. See, he does not need to offer sacrifices because he has never sinned. It says first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the Torah, the law, appoints men in their weakness. There's the connection what I said earlier, the weakness and the uselessness. That is not the law of Moses. That is the priests who did a poor job of administering it. The law appoints men in their weakness, as high priests, but the word of an oath, which came later than the Torah, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So if I go back to Galatians, uh, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does refer to the Levitical priesthood and the system of sacrifices. That is how we compare and contrast what we now have that's so much better. We have a high priest, we don't have to sacrifice animals uh, to cover up for our sin. That was a band-aid that was put into place. God gave uh, Abraham the promise. 430 years later, because of transgressions, because of the rampant sin and disobedience to the Torah, the Levitical priesthood was instituted until the promise made to Abraham was fulfilled when Messiah Yeshua showed up on the scene and took the priesthood back. It's not something new. Melchizedek was before the Levites, and Yeshua just simply took it back over. He leased the priesthood to them, and then he took it over. That is what came 430 years after the promise to Abraham. But the Torah, the commandments, the instructions of our Father always existed. We can see it in the garden. We can see it all throughout the book of Genesis. And uh, we'll probably continue talking about Galatians in, a, in another video, but understand that this is what it's talking about. This is how the covenant is better. It's just like the oil changing place down the road. It's the same prices, it's the same service, but the one who's doing it is flawless. This manager is actually taking care of customers and doing things right. When you pay for a tire rotation, you get a tire rotation. That's what's changed, that's what's better. Keep the commandments, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. just understand that the priesthood has been transferred uh, back to Yeshua with whom it started with, and that's how you explain the law coming 430 years later, even though Genesis 26, 5 says that Abraham kept the Torah. So be like Abraham, keep the Torah. Until next time, thanks for watching.